Hi, everyone. I'm here reading chapter three of I Thought It Was Just Me, but it isn't making the journey from what will people think to I am enough. Chapter three, the first element, recognizing shame and understanding our triggers. If we're going to build shame resiliency, we have to start by recognizing and identifying shame. Because shame floods us with strong emotions like fear and blame, we often can't recognize what's happening until after we've already reacted in a way that moves us away from our authenticity and, in some cases, exasperates our shame. For example, the mother whose credit card was declined, she was overwhelmed with feelings of shame and took it out on her crying child. Most of us with children are not strangers to that phenomenon. It happens in a split second. The goal is to learn to recognize when we are experiencing shame quickly enough to prevent ourselves from lashing out at those around us. Or if, as in this example, we have already yelled at our child, we want to learn to immediately stop, calm down, take a breath, and make amends. Somewhat paradoxically, our bodies often react to shame even before our conscious mind does. Our conscious minds do. People always think it's strange when I ask them where and how they physically feel shame. And for those of you that have been attending the book review, we've talked about this. But for most of us, shame has a feeling. It's physical as well as emotional. This is why I often refer to shame as a full contact emotion. Women have described various physical reactions to shame, including stomach tightening, nausea, shaking, waves of heat in their face and chest, wincing, twinges of smallness. And if we can recognize our physical responses, sometimes we can limit the powerlessness that we feel when we're in shame. When I started this research project, I was unaware of my own physical response to shame. I only started investigating them after interviewing the first 50 women. At that point in the research, it became clear to me that women with high levels of shame resiliency recognize and could describe their physical reactions to shame. One woman told me, my mouth gets really dry and I feel like I can't swallow. I try to recognize it and name it right away. When I asked her how, she she said she starts whispering, pain, 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 pain. She explained once she could acknowledge what's happening, she could make better choices about how to deal with it. I thought it was a little strange until I tried it. I doubt it will work for everyone, but I think it's a great example of how recognizing a physical indication of shame increases our opportunity to be mindful and to react consciously. The questions below are designed to help us focus on recognizing our physical reaction to shame. Spend some time thinking about these or answering them on a paper. Some may fit for you and others may not. I physically feel shame in on my, it feels like, I know I'm in shame when I feel, If I could taste shame, it would taste like, if I could smell shame, it would smell like, if I could touch shame, it would feel like. Recognizing shame is an important tool for regaining our power. For example, I know that I need to be alone for at least 15 or 20 minutes when I'm experiencing shame. Now that I recognize the physical symptoms, I often, use, I often use those as a cue to make a quick exit. Once I'm alone, I could feel my feelings in private. I can cry or take deep breaths. Most of the women I interviewed talked about the importance of being alone for a few minutes so they can pull themselves together or sort through their feelings. I also had women tell me that they like to jog, go for walks, or be outside. When we know how shame feels, we have an important resilience, resilience tool, resiliency tool. Often we feel shame before we think it. Recognizing our shame allows us to find the space we need to process the experience and gain some clarity before we act, act out or shut down. 
the next step in examining our experiences is to better understand our shame triggers. Shame triggers. When I first began my research, one of my goals was to develop a list of shame triggers. My thinking was pretty simple. If we knew what issue, if we knew what issues triggered shame, we could st stay alert and if not avoid them, at least increase our awareness about the potential of experiencing shame. Of course, it didn't take long to learn that shame is a highly individualized experience and that there are, are no universal shame triggers. Of course not. Along with other researchers, I found that the issues and experiences that trigger shame appear to be individual and different as women. Their relationships and their cultures. I often learn I also learned that we face shame every day. No matter how well we can recognize our triggers, avoiding shame is not possible. However, as I spoke to women, I saw a very strong pattern emerged in the interviews. Women with high levels of shame resiliency recognize shame and understand their shame triggers. When women with high shame resiliency talked about their shame, they clearly knew what triggered it and why some issues were greater triggers than others. Recognizing and understanding our triggers is not something that we instinctively know how to do. It's a process. Sylvia's story is a great example of this first element of resiliency in action. Sylvia, an event planner in her 30s, jumped right into our interview by saying, I wish you could have interviewed me six months ago. I was a different person. I was so stuck in shame. When I asked her what she meant, she explained that she had heard about my research from a friend and volunteered to be interviewed because she felt her life had been changed by shame. She had recently had an important breakthrough. Sylvia said her breakthrough happened when she found herself on the losers list at work. Apparently, after two years of what her employer called outstanding winner's work, she had made her first big mistake. The mistake cost her agency a major client. Her boss's response was to put her on the loser's list. She said, in one minute, I went from being on the winner's board to being on top of the loser's list. I guess I must have winced when Sylvia referred to the loser's list because without my remarking at all, she said, I know it's terrible. My boss has big dry erase boards outside of his office. Once, once the winner's list, one is the winner's list and one board is for the losers. She said for weeks she could barely function. She lost her con confidence and started missing work. Shame, anxiety, and fear took over. Then one evening, Sylvia was talking to her sister about the loser board and it all started to make sense. Sylvia and her sister had been very competitive, had been very competitive athletes in high school. Sylvia had even been offered a scholarship but turned it down. As Sylvia and her sister talked, her sister reminded Sylvia about their father's constant use of the word loser. No one likes a loser. Losers never change. He would post their track times on the refrigerator door along with sticky notes that said, Things like, be a winner. Sylvia said, I got off the phone with my sister, cried, and started working on my resume. I realized that I couldn't work there anymore. It's, it's not just the word loser that throws me into shame. It's the whole idea of believing that you're either good or bad. You can't be good and have a bad day or make a bad decision. You can't be a good runner and run a bad race. I'm embarrassed, or I guess... It's really a shame that I used to be like that. I laughed at the people on the losers list until I was on it. I made fun of the losers just like my dad and my boss. I regret not competing in college. I could have gone to a better school with a scholarship. Now I know I didn't go because I, I wouldn't have always been a winner with the level of com competition. Now I'm afraid of being less than perfect and my sister is still struggling with an eating disorder. That's how bad it was to be a loser in my family. Sylvia later told me that she and her sister made a pact to call each other whenever they felt that they were, they were called, 
Sylvia later told me that she and her sister made a pact to call each other whenever they felt what they called loser shame. Does that mean that Sylvia is no longer vulnerable to feeling shame around failing or being cast as a loser? Absolutely not. No level of shame resiliency provides us with immunity. What it means is Sylvia will have much more awareness about what she's feeling when it happens again. This process gives her better tools to step back and think about what happened and why it happened. Then she can start to work her way out of it constructively. Unwanted identities. To start the process of recognizing our shame triggers, we need to look at the concept of unwanted identities. Over the course of the interviews, 12 categories emerged as areas in which women struggled the most with feelings of shame. These categories are appearance and body image, motherhood, family, parenting, money and work, mental and physical health, sex, aging, religion, being stereotyped and labeled, speaking out and surviving trauma. What makes us vulnerable to shame in these areas are the unwanted identities associated with each of these topics. For example, many women use adjectives like loudmouth and pushy to describe unwanted identities associated with speaking out. These specific unwanted identities surfaced in the interviews as women described the difficulty of navigating all of the message and stereotypes that discourage them from taking on an unpopular stand on an issue or sharing opinions that might make others feel uncomfortable. Researcher Tamara Ferguson, Heidi Erie, and Michael Ash Baker argue that unwanted identity is the quintessential elicitor of shame. They explain that unwanted identities are characteristics that undermine our vision of our ideal selves. Sometimes we perceive others as, assigned, as assigning their unwanted identities to us, and other times we pin them on ourselves. For example, I don't think any of us would ideally describe ourselves as pushy loudmouths, nor would we want others to describe us this way. These hurtful stereotypes are often used successfully, I might add, to keep women quiet. We don't even have to be pushy or boisterous to fear these labels. It's been socially, it's been socialized in us. How many women are called um, pushy and loudmouths? Hmm. So where do unwanted identities come from? The messages and stereotypes that are often the most powerful are those that we learn from our families of origin. The term family of origin refers to the family in which we were reared. In my interviews with both men and women, it was obvious that many of the unwanted identities that cause us to feel shame stem from messages we heard growing up and the stereotypes we were taught by our parents or immediate caregivers. Sometimes teachers, clergy, and other important adults in our lives may have helped us shape our thinking. However, parents and caregivers are by far the most influential. I would venture to say that when it comes to the 12 shame categories, every family has identified identities they value and likewise unwanted identities that are seen as shamefully unacceptable or unworthy. For example, in my family being sick was an unwanted identity. We never really talked about illness. I never heard my parents say anything negative about sickness or health issues. However, I grew up believing that illness was weakness. Interestingly, interestingly, my parents didn't shame us for being sick, and they were empathetic and helpful with neighbors or family members who were sick. However, they were both hard on themselves when they got sick, which was rare. When they were sick, they toughed it out. They didn't slow down. If they had surgery, they were back on carpool duties or back at work right away. So if you combine this upbringing with a culture that despises the sick, you could see how being sick becomes a powerfully powerful unwanted identity for me. This was never a problem until I became very ill when I was pregnant. 
not only did I get sick, I was diagnosed with hypo, oh, I'm not even going to try that, a pregnancy-related condition characterized by extreme nausea, vomiting, and dehydration. So there I was, throwing up 25 times a day, unable to keep down ice chips, hospitalized for severe hy- dehydration, and spending what little energy I had trying to figure out if any of the hospital rooms had internet access or if maybe Steve would videotape me teaching from my bed. That was the dean. That was the dean wouldn't need to, that way the dean wouldn't need to bring in another instructor to take over my class. I kept telling Steve, this can't be happening. I'm tough. I don't get sick. Finally, out of frustration, he lovingly held my face in his hands and said, well, apparently you do get sick. And right now you're not so tough. You're human like the rest of us. You really need to work through this. You're not going back to work for a couple of months. This is serious. You need to apply some of your own shame medicine right now. Family messages die hard. And many times they're very... The messages become part of the fabrics of our lives. Until we can recognize and understand why and how they influence our life, we can just keep living by them and passing them down to the next generation. I don't believe my parents consciously introduced the message about illness or weakness to our family. In fact, as I get older... I'm able to look back with more clarity and perspective. I'm sure they were also prisoners of this message. Both my parents were raised in families where their beliefs about toughness and weakness seem to be encoded in the genes. I think, if anything, they just unknowingly pass them along. I've had to work very hard to break the cycle with my children. And as my experiences demonstrate, it doesn't have anything to do with what I say or how I treat others. I have to watch what I do and how I treat myself when I'm feeling sick. Being married to a very compassionate physician helps. He often reminds me that being tough is more about being lucky. That's when illness strikes. Toughness toughness has nothing to do with it. We're all vulnerable. Of course, families don't operate in a vacuum. Like individuals, they are influenced by the culture and history. I interviewed Deidre, a woman in her 60s, who told me that she had spent years being shamed by her mother about money and indulgent behavior. Deidre described her house as nice, but not over the top. Yet when her mom would come visit, she would walk through the house picking up things and saying, look at this place. Who do you think you are, the queen of sheep? All you do is spend, spend, spend. You spoiled your kids rotten and you live like this, like there's no tomorrow. I can't believe you're my child. Deidre's mom, mother was a child of the depression. For her, any material possession that wasn't a necessity was extravagant and wasteful. And both extravagancy and wastefulness were major major unwanted identities that she used to shame her daughter. In addition to the messages and stereotypes passed down through our families of origin, we also live in a world with partners, colleagues, friends, community members, where TV and magazines do nothing but set expectations and define what is and what is not acceptable. I don't want to just... Dismiss the important roles that all these factors play in our lives. However, in my research, it was painfully clear that the shaming wounds inflicted in our first families often set the stage for many of our greatest shame struggles. I have to say a little note on magazines and newspapers and media and how it portrays all of us as looking a certain way and wearing certain clothes and having our hair a certain way. And anyways, if I picked up a magazine right now and I showed it to you, it would definitely make um, a majority of us feel like we're not dressed the right way. And when a majority of us are dressed just the way we are, because we're who we are. Um, 
I have been asked many times if I think that shame can only be experienced in areas where we have been shamed by our parents or caregivers, but I don't think that this is the case. I do believe we are more vulnerable to shame triggers than de that developed from our families of origin. However, I interviewed many people who struggle with shame around issues that stem from other places, namely cultural messages and stereotypes. This is especially true of women and men who are under 40. For many people in this age group, the, me the media has become the primary storytelling in their lives. Along with their families, TV is now setting the expectations in defining the unwanted identities. The strength of vulnerability. When I first started writing on shame, I actually referred to this element of shame resiliency as acknowledging our vulnerability rather than understanding our shame triggers. I changed it for a couple of reasons. First, over the past two years, I've received hundreds of letters and emails from people who are, excuse me, who are applying the strategies they are outlined, that are outlined in this book to build shame resiliency. In the vast majority of these letters, people write about the power of discovering their shame triggers. In many ways, I think the term shame triggers just rings truer for people than the term acknowledging vulnerability. Second, I think people still struggle with the term vulnerability. We equate vulnerability with, the weak, with weakness, and in our culture, there are very few things we ab abhorn more than weakness. Regardless of the words we choose, recognizing and understanding our triggers is essential, essentially the same as recognizing and understanding our vulnerabilities, and this is a source of strength. Vulnerability is not weakness. Sometimes we are afraid that acknowledging that sometimes exists is going to make it worse. For example, if I acknowledge that being perceived as a good mother is really important, and if I accept the fact that motherhood is a vulnerable issue for me, is the shame around this issue going to grow? No, this is simply not true. When we feel shame about an experience, we often feel some overwhelming combination of confusion, fear, and judgment. If it happens in an, in an area where we know we are vulnerable, we're much more likely to come out of that confusion, fear, and judgment with an instinct about what we're feeling and what we need to do to find support. Again, my cookie appropriation, appropriation story provides a good example. I want to be a good mother and I want to be perceived as a good mother. So when somebody says something to me or when I do or feel something that threatens my good mom status, my shame is triggered. I'm not surprised when I'm overcome by feelings of shame around this issue. I may still feel pain, confusion, fear, and judgment, but I have just enough information to react a little more quickly than I would have if if it were an area of unacknowledged, unacknowledged vulnerability. Like if I didn't know that motherhood was a shame trigger for me. When we experience shame, we often feel confused, fearful, and judged. This makes it very difficult to access the awareness we need to evaluate our choices. We're in a fog. That's how shame makes us powerless. After my exchange with Ellen's teacher, I knew I needed to talk to somebody in my connection network, but it was still a difficult call to make. Here's how four other women describe the importance of recognizing their trigger or acknowledging their vulnerability. Number one, I only see my therapist three or four times a year, one time after each trip to visit my parents. I know they love me, but I also know they use shame and judge me about how fat and unmarried, about being fat and unmarried. I make the trips for all of us, but I see my therapist afterwards for myself. Number two, if there's one thing I've learned, it's to never bring up money around my mother-in-law. If she starts worrying about me and my husband, she starts shaming us about buying too much. It took me several years to learn that, but it makes a big difference. We don't fight, and I don't avoid her like the plague. 
Number three, in my second year of fertility problems, I finally accepted the fact that I couldn't go to baby showers. When you're in your early 30s, it seemed like there's a baby shower every weekend. I found myself going and missing. I found myself going and making an, a, you know what, an ASS out of myself. I would talk about how great it was to have the freedom and flexibility of not having kids. I'd ask stupid questions about the horrors of labor. The only person who knew we were trying to get pregnant was my best friend. After one particularly bad shower, she confronted me. She said I was being mean and not like myself. She asked me if it was about the fertility problems. When I realized it was, I had a total breakdown. She helped me through it. She also helped me understand that it was okay to not go to all the showers. A few years ago, number four, a few years ago after my husband died, I started going out with a gentleman from our Domino's Club. About six months after we started spending time together, I asked my daughter if I could talk to her about sex. I wasn't looking for the birds and bees conversation. Certainly her existence would prove that I knew how things worked. She's a health teacher at a junior high school, and I have heard, I had heard her talking about AIDS. Well, my friend had had a blood transfusion some years back and wanted to know about the risk. When I sat down with her and started explaining my questions, she said, you got to be kidding me, mother. That's disgusting. I don't ever want to talk about that again. I was completely mortified. I said, what do you mean disgusting? She told me that I was disgusting for even thinking about having sex with somebody at my age. Up until that moment, I didn't think much about it. I thought it was natural. I thought it was good that I was asking the right questions. When she said that to me, when she called me disgusting, it was so belittling. I completely lost my confidence. I regressed. I regressed. You could say, I thought to myself, what am I thinking? What am I doing? But I know my daughter could really get me stirred up. She could act very holier than thou like her father. Luckily, I have some very dear friends. I talked to them, and they helped me make sense of it. I went right along with my plans, but I kept her out of it. I guess you could say we have a don't ask, don't tell policy. It's not just shame resiliency that is increased when we acknowledge our vulnerability. Several other fields of study, including health psychology and social psychology, have produced very persuasive evidence on the importance of acknowledging vulnerability. From the field of health psychology, studies show that perceived vulnerability, meaning the ability to acknowledge that we're at risk, greatly increases our chance of adhering to some kind of positive regime, positive health regime, sorry. For example, we can know everything about our illness. We can score perfectly on a 100-question test we can know people who have had that illness. However, if we don't think we're vulnerable to that illness, we won't do anything to prevent it from happening. Health, um, health, psychology, re health psychology researchers have determined that in order to get patients to comply with prevention routines, they must work on perceived vulnerability. And just like building resiliency to shame, the critical issue is not about our level of vulnerability, but the level at which we acknowledge our vulnerability. From the fields of social psychology, influence and persuasion researchers have studied personal vulnerability. These are researchers who examine how people are influenced and persuaded by advertising and marketing. In a very interesting series of studies, researchers found that the participants who thought they were not susceptible or vulnerable to deceptive advertising were, in fact, the most vulnerable. It just makes me think of like the political arena that we're in right now. Um, the researchers explained Far from being an effective shield, the illusion of invulnerability undermines the very response that would have supplied genuine protection.
Let me say that again. Far from being an effective shield, the illusion of invulnerability undermines the very response that would have supplied genuine protection. Again, this is very counterintuitive concept because it challenges everything we think about the vulnerabil about vulnerability. Judith Jordan, a relational cultural theorist from the Stone Center at Wesleyan College, points out another difficulty in acknowledging personal vulnerability. Jordan writes, acknowledging vulnerability is possibly only if we Vulnerability is possible only if we feel we can reach out for support. To do so, we must feel some competence in our relationships. Competency in our relationships. Acknowledging vulnerability is possible only if we feel we can reach out for support. To do so, we must feel comp some competency in our relationships. The likelihood of our finding the insight and courage to acknowledge our personal vulnerability is dependent on our ability to share and talk about those vulnerabilities with someone we trust and with whom we feel safe. If we don't have people we can trust in our lives or we have yet to build those kinds of relationship, we must reach outside of our existing connection network of friends and family for professional help. For, for, professional help, sorry. Therapists and counselors spend a large part of their practice helping people identify and understanding their vulnerabilities. And as a result, they are frequently able to help clients build or identify relationships that can serve as connection networks. For most of us to successfully begin to recognize and understand our shame, resi our shame triggers, we first need to accept that acknowledging our vulnerabilities is an act of courage. We must, be, we must be mindful in our attempts not to see vulnerability as weakness. I'm very lucky when it comes to this difficult endeavor. My mom taught me a tremendous lesson about vulnerability and courage. In the late 1980s, my mom's only sibling, my uncle Ronnie, was killed in a violent shooting. Just months after his death, my grandmother basically checked out mentally and emotionally. Having been an alcoholic most of her life, my grandmother didn't have the emotional resources she needed to survive a traumatic loss like that. For weeks, she roamed her neighborhood, randomly asking the same people over and over if they had heard about his death. One day, right after my uncle's memorial service, my mom totally broke down. I had seen her cry once or twice, but I, but I certainly had never seen her cry uncontrollably. My sisters and I were afraid and crying mostly because we were so scared to see her like that. I finally told her that we didn't know what to do because we had never seen her so weak. She looked at us and said in a very loving yet forceful voice, I'm not weak. I'm stronger than you can imagine. I'm just very vulnerable right now. If I were weak, I'd be dead. In that split second, I knew my mom was probably the strongest, most courageous woman I had ever known. I would ever know. She did more than give us permission to use the word vulnerable. She taught us that acknowledging our vulnerability is a true act of original courage. The shame trigger question. How do we start to recognize our shame triggers? What do we need to do to start acknowledging our vulnerabilities? I think we begin by examining each of the shame categories and trying to unearth the unwanted identities that cause us shame. As I interviewed both men and women, many of the same phrases kept coming up in the interviews. The ones that I heard over and over were, I don't want to be seen as, and I don't want people to think I'm. There were many variations on this, including I would die if people thought I was, or I couldn't stand people thinking I'm. <clears throat> As these phrases indicated, shame is about perception. Shame is how we see ourselves through other people's eyes. When I interviewed women about shame experiences, it was always about how others 
see me or what others think. And often there is even a disconnection between who we want to be and how we want to be perceived. For example, one woman in her 70s told me, I'm okay when I'm alone. I know I'm changing. I know things are slowing down and everything is not what it used to be. I just can't stand the thought of others seeing it and dismissing me as a person. Being dismissed is shameful. Another good example is body image. We might stand in front of the mirror naked thinking, hmm, not perfect, but okay. But the moment we think of someone else seeing us, especially someone who's critical, we can just feel the warmth, the warm wave of shame wash over us. Even if we are totally alone, we rush to cover up. Once we're covered, we fight to push the thought of being exposed out of our mind. That's shame. To help us begin to recognize some of our shame triggers, let's look at the questions I use in my work shop sessions. We start, we start with these fill in the blank statements, which should be answered separately for each of the shame categories. I want to be perceived as, I do not want to be perceived as. These are fairly simple statements. However, when you start to think about these questions in relationship or in relation to the 12 shame categories, this could be a probing and powerful start to the process. But it's important to remember that's only a start. As I've said throughout the book, there are no easy answers or quick fixes. The next step is to try to uncover the source of these triggers. When the research participants spoke up about their shame triggers, they were able to express an understanding of how and why these triggers developed in their lives. Sylvia's story is a good example of this. The winner-loser dynamic is a shame trigger for Sylvia. The source of this trigger go, goes back to the enormous pressure she was under from her father when she was a competitive athlete. If we look at our unwanted identities, three questions that can help us to start to over, uncover the sources are, number one, what do these perceptions mean to us? Number two, why are they so unwanted? Number three, where did this message that fuel these identities come from? When it comes to shame, understanding is a prerequisite for change. We can't consciously make the decision to change our behavior until we're aware of what we are thinking and why we are thinking it. Before she understood the source of her shame, Sylvia actually used the winner-loser framework to shame others. Changing that behavior required her to recognize the power it had in her own life and to understand the source of that power. In the introduction, we met Susan, Kayla, Teresa, and Sandra. Let's take a look at the shame triggers they describe and how these unwanted identities played out in their experiences. Susan was contemplating returning to work until a shaming conversation with her sister. In this exercise, Susan fo um, focused on perceptions around motherhood. She wrote, I want to be perceived as dedicated to my child, putting motherhood before everything else, confident and easygoing. I don't want to be perceived as selfish, too ambitious, uncaring, or uptight. Susan told me that after spending some time looking at these, she wasn't the least bit surprised that her sister's comment threw her into shame. She painted a picture of me that struck, struck at my biggest fear. My parents didn't believe, my parents don't believe mothers should work. They attribute the world's problems to the breakdown of the traditional family. I guess now my sister has adopted that belief. If you combine my family's belief with the whole working mothers versus stay at home mothers mentality, there you have it. Number two. After confiding in her boss about becoming a caregiver for her father, Kayla was criticized at work for always being caught in family drama. She wrote about how she wants to be perceived at work. I want to be perceived as competent, strong, dependable, focused, and committed. I don't, I don't want to be perceived as scattered, untrustworthy, too emotional, hysterical, or flaky. Number three. 
As Kayla studied what she wrote, she came to an important realization. She said, when I think about the people I've worked with who are normally very professional, but sometimes act scattered and emotional at work, I'm hard on them. I've never bothered to find out what's going on and why they're having a hard time. My attitude has always been, hey, check your personal crap at the door. We have work to do here. I'm not sure where those messages came from or come from. I guess everywhere. No one likes a slacker and no one likes the kind of person who brings their personal stuff to work. Both of my parents were in the newspaper business, so they were all, they were all business. They also didn't like overly emotional people. I always think it's very competitive. I always think it's the very competitive work environment. Women had to work twice as hard. All of these unwanted characteristics get slapped on women all the time. Nancy, my boss, is the worst. She survives in an agency by attacking other women who bring any family stuff to work. Her favorite put-downs are to call someone a drama queen or say, don't get so hysterical. Number three, Teresa's quest for the perfect body, house, and family resulted in a breakdown witnessed by her child. She examined her identities as they related to her family. I want my family to be perceived as fun-loving, laid-back, organized, happy, and good-looking. I don't want people to think that they're always stressed, falling apart, chaotic, or unhappy. Teresa found Teresa found it very difficult to talk about her ideal perceptions. She told me, I can't believe I care about my family being good looking. That's a horrible thing to care about. It's just you see these families where everyone is dressed nicely. No one is wrinkled or messy. The moms are pretty, the dads are good looking, and the kids are super cute. Their houses look like something out of Pottery Barn catalog. Then you look at yourself and your kids. You wonder how they do that. What are they doing that you're not doing? What are they doing that you don't know about? We're late everywhere we go. By the time I get the last kid dressed, the first one has stuff all over them. I asked her if she knew any families that met her ideals. And after thinking about it, she said, yes, my family growing up. She told me that her family was perfect looking on the outside and that everyone always complimented her mother on how well-dressed and well-behaved her children were. She told me her mom was very appearance conscious and was always watching her weight. And I have to just close the door and dressing to the nines. Teresa started crying as she told me there was a price though. After my mom tucked us in, in, after my mom tucked us in every night, she started drinking. My parents have always had a cold, quiet marriage. She stopped drinking a few years ago, but we don't talk much. We certainly never talked about this issue. Number four, Sandra was able to quickly identify her triggers. She had a notepad in front of her and she wrote down, I don't want people to see someone who is stupid, always saying the wrong things uninformed or uneducated. I want pe people to see a strong woman who is smart, well-read, knowledgeable, intelligent, well-spoken, and can balance her passion and her knowledge. Sandra explained, the minute my husband told me that I, I embarrassed him when I talked politics and religion with Don, I knew I'd never say another word. He knew how much that would hurt. He went in for the kill. She thought for a minute and said, Maybe I'm just hurting myself by trying to show him, but that's where I am right now. Sandra explained that her parents had raised her to live proud and out loud, but they did not, did not prepare her for the consequences of doing that. She said growing up, her teacher shamed her. Her minister told her she talked too much and never made any sense. Her husband was always trying to get her to tone it down and even her in-laws gave her a hard time for being too excitable and opinionated. I've never been called opinionated. <laughs> As you look at these assessments of their shame triggers and maybe your own, I want to talk about the issues that always surface when I do this exercise at the workshop. 
First, we are very hard on ourselves. Uh, when we identify these desired and unwanted identities, we give ourselves very little room to be human. Second, we cannot deny the power of the messages we heard growing up. Last, most of us judge others whom we perceive as having the traits we dislike in ourselves. When participants do the exercise in large groups, I often ask how many people found that I want to be perceived question more difficult to answer and how many found that I don't want to be perceived question more difficult. It's always about 50-50. Those who find the ideal perceptions more difficult to acknowledge often talk about feeling bad for placing so much value on these identities and sometimes feeling shame for even thinking anyone would ever see them this way. For those who find the unwanted identities more difficult to talk about, I often hear that it is painful and scary to look at this list. There's a third set of questions that is very important to this exercise. Examine your list of unwanted identities and ask yourself, if people reduce me to this list, what important and wonderful things will they miss about me? For example, if all Kayla's colleagues see is a coworker who is scattered, untrustworthy, too emotional, and flaky, they'll miss the fact that Kayla is very dedicated to her work, talented, and committed loving daughter who is doing the best she can to manage a stressful, painful experience. It's very important that we acknowledge that we are a complex, vulnerable people who both, with both strengths and challenges. This is what makes us human and real. Most everyone agrees upon the importance of actually writing down these exercises. I know for me, it is much more difficult to write these words out and stare at them on a piece of paper. I also know that it's much more meaningful, meaningful. I can get my head around them. I can be still and reflect. Sometimes we believe that acknowledging our triggers will make them worse. We convince ourselves that if we pretend they don't exist, it's somehow easier. It's not. Our feelings, beliefs, and actions are motivated by these triggers, regardless of whether we write them down and acknowledge them or we pretend they don't exist. Recognizing and understanding them is the only path to change. In this next section, I'm going to introduce the concept of shame, shame screens. As you could see in this illustration on the previous page, we don't recognize shame and understand the messages and expectations that trigger our shame. We often rely on our shame screens to protect us. As you'll learn, not only is relying on shame screens ineffective, it can often be shame inducing in itself. Shame screens. I came up with this term shame screen after analyzing data from the first hundred interviews. As women explain that un predictable and sometimes unconscious way they reacted in response to shame, I realized the experience shared some time, something in common. When we're, we are in shame, we often are overcome with the need to hide or purchase, protect ourselves by any means possible. As I thought about our protective reactions to shame, I kept envisioning smoke screens, the canisters of dense smoke used by the military to hide their activities from the enemy. Unfortunately, shame screens don't work. We're not dealing with tanks and infantry behind enemy lines. We're dealing with people and relationships. Wouldn't it be great if we could just carry those canisters on our belt and when somebody hurt our feelings, shamed us or made us angry, we could just whip out our canister of thick smoke, launch it out, launch it and run. Or we can just, uh, or we can even just stand there behind the wall of smoke and make rude gestures. Please, I'd order them by the case if that, if I thought they'd work. Unfortunately, we just can't do that. The reality is that when we throw up the shame screen, we usually we're usually the one who ends up choking on the smoke. When we experience shame, our first level, 
When we experience shame, our first layer of defense often occurs involuntarily. It goes back to our primal flight, fight, and freeze response. Dr. Shelley Urram, Harvard-trained psychiatrist, is currently the consulting psychiatrist at the Meadows, a trauma and addiction treatment facility. In her work, Dr. Urram explains that most of us think of traumatic events as big events, like car wrecks and disaster, disasters. But Dr. Earl points out that we tend to not recognize the small, quiet traumas that often trigger the same brain survival reaction. After studying Dr. Erm's work, I believe it's possible that many of our early shame experiences, especially with parents and caregivers, were stored in our brains as trauma. This is why we often have such painful body reactions when we feel criticized, ridiculed, rejected, and shamed. Dr. Erm explains that the brain does not differentiate between overt or big traumas or co- and covert or small, quiet traumas. It just registers the event as a threat that we can't control. In her work on remembering the wound versus becoming the wound, Dr. Earl explains that most of the time when we recall a memory, we are conscious that we are in the present recalling something from the past. However, when we experience something in the present that triggers an old trauma memory, we re-experience the sense of the original trauma. So rather than remembering the wound, we become the wound. This makes sense when we think of how we We are often returned to a place of smallness and helplessness when we feel shame. After our physical fight, flight, or freeze response, strategies of disconnection provide us with a more complex layer of shame screens. Dr. Linda Hartley, a relational cultural theorist, used Karen Horney's work on moving towards, moving against, and moving away to outline the strategies of disconnection we use to deal with shame. According to Dr. Hartley, in order to to deal with shame, some of us move away by withdrawing, hiding, silencing ourselves, and keeping secrets. Some of us move towards by seeking to appease and please. And some of us move against by trying to gain power over others, being aggressive and using shame to fight shame. During a recent workshop, I was presenting these strategies of disconnection and they were lettered on my side, on my slide A, B, C. A woman raised her hand and asked, is there a D for all of the above? We all laughed. I think most of us are Ds. Most of us can relate to all three strategies of disconnection. I know I've used them all, depending on why and how I feel ashamed and who I am with. I'm less likely to move against when there's a power differential, bosses, doctors, or someone I'm trying to impress, new friends, colleagues. In those situations, I'm more likely to move towards or move away. Unfortunately, I think I reserve moving against for the people with whom I feel the deepest connection, my family members and close friends. This is often where it feels safest to dump our anger and fear. We develop our shame screens over years. Sometimes the way we handle shame has become so deeply ingrained in us that we can't even see it. Other times we'll read books or listen to other people's stories and recognize our own patterns. Either way, it takes much more than reading a book to change how we feel, act, and believe. We could learn and become wiser about who we are and how we behave from reading a book, but we need to put these ideas into practice. We change in and through our relationship with others. Sometimes we can do that with friends and families. Other times we need the support of a therapist or counselor who we can walk, who can walk us through the process. It's a unique and individual journey. How we get there depends on who we are. Another thing to keep in mind is that resiliency is not one-time cure. Don't think that I've spent all this time and energy 
dissecting my experiences and the payoff is no more shame screens for me. I still use ineffective shame screens. It happens all the time. I'm just much more likely to move through it qu uh, quicker and with fewer casualties. The next exercise is identifying our shame screens. As you think about each of the shame categories and the triggers associated with, with each category, try to think of a specific shame experience. How did you respond? Is that a pattern? How do you protect, protect yourself in these situations? Let's take a look at Susan, Kayla, Teresa, Sandra, and Jillian. Susan, I'm definitely somebody who moves away or moves towards. I don't like conflict. I don't get aggressive or mean. I just try to make everyone happy. Of course, it never works, and I get resentful. It will be very difficult to tell my mom and sister that their comments are shaming to me. I'm not quite ready, but I think eventually, but I think I'll eventually do it. Kayla, there should be one called copycatting. I think I just turn into Nancy and mimic everything she does. It's how I deal with her. If you can't beat them, join them. I just never realize how much it hurts to be on the receiving end. I guess a combination of moving towards and moving against. I suck up when I'm with her. I confide in her when I shouldn't. Then I shame other coworkers for the things she shames me for. That's my shame. Shame screen. Teresa, I definitely move towards. I want to please and live up to the expectation. Sandra, I do it all. I shut down, act up, act out. You name it. In this case, I shut down until I started figuring out what was what was going on. I couldn't see that kind of example for my girl. I couldn't set that kind of example for my girls. It's too dangerous. My tendency is to move away, especially with my husband. It's like a form of punishment because I know he'll miss any, my normal rowdy self. In the next chapters, I'll discuss the importance of reality checking our shame triggers. This, help us, this helps us build resiliency by connecting our unwanted identity with the larger societal expectation that drives shame. This is essential to developing shame resiliency because no matter how alone shame makes us feel, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. So that was chapter three of I Thought It Was Just Me, But It Isn't by Brene Brown. Again, we have book discussions every Friday at one o'clock from one to two. Please come join us. We have great conversations about what shame feels like, what it looks like. We have conversations about um, ways that we can change it from affecting our lives going forward. So I hope that you had a really um, great time listening to me read that. If you want to discuss it, come on Fridays at 1 o'clock. Go to Toivo uh, toivocenter.org and you can check out our calendar and it'll have the zoom link there so i hope you have a great rest of your day afternoon whenever you're watching this and thank you so much bye